Hey, what's going on? Um, so a couple of people, uh, most notably Gary Lamb, actually contacted me about the interview that The Undertaker gave on Joe Rogan's podcast. <clears throat> um, I was going to look at the part that's really in dispute in the wrestling business and causing all the hubbub about The Undertaker. I'll just sum it up because it doesn't really require much more than that. Him saying that modern wrestling is soft that the guys are not edgy enough. Um, he didn't really assign blame for that, but he did mention that in the locker room, it used to be guys brought knives and guns to the ring, and nowadays guys were way more t content to play video games. Um, he did mention that the guys back in the day did play cards, but his contention was it's just a softer time, a softer age, and the product isn't edgy enough um, to be engaging. Uh, I... I'm going to address those things, but I was actually much more fascinated with his discussions about um, meeting Vince McMahon and the origin of the Undertaker character and what was going through his mind when he met Vince McMahon in the house. And I'll address these other things as well. Um, Austin Watson, a.k.a. Xavier Woods, also did, I, I thought, a very um, smart and um, well thought out and reasoned and interesting take on Undertaker's contention about like his sort of derisive attitude about like the video game playing modern culture. And I've talked about this many times as well. Um, so it's, uh, but my thoughts will become kind of evident as we go through this thing about Undertaker. All right. So let's, uh, let's take a listen. Uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. This was one of the better ones that they've had, honestly. Um, Joe Rogan does have, in my opinion, a really great ability to get guys comfortable um, and bringing up insightful things. And even um, his sidekick on this occasion, who's a comedian that I absolutely like, he's, he's really in that kind of like roast comedian um, sort of genre. But he had very, like, greater little additions to say as well. Um, so I really enjoyed this. It's about nine minutes long, and it's about the origins of the Undertaker character, but with a whole lot more added. So let's listen. The Joe Rogan experience. How did you become the Undertaker? So, <laughs> so I, that's that's Vince's brainchild. So I went to another company, WCW, where I was uh, Mean Mark Callis, and uh, right there, check that young stud out right there. That's terrible. It's terrible, right? It's it's funny that he can he can look at that stuff and he doesn't have any sense of nostalgia about it at all, right? It's just that was terrible. Um, you know what's crazy is if you look at that picture of uh, me, Mark Callis, could that not be 95% of the guys working today? I'm just based on this simple appearance alone. And what's funny is this look is also reminiscent of who? Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it wasn't just about the appearance, it was about what was happening. Me and Mark Callis didn't really have anything. Um, I love this smile by Joe Rogan. It's very genuine. Um, this conversation, it's worth listening to in its entirety. Um, and it really is sort of a great bantering back and forth between Rogan and really Undertaker just kind of unloading all of these things. You could tell he's done the circuit lately. He was on Stone Cold's podcast and, you know, a lot of conversation around his uh, documentary series and like the, and, and the like. And he's very comfortable speaking. Um, I would imagine Undertaker would be one of those books that would be absolutely amazing, except for the fact that so much would be left out, similar to like the Ric Flair book or even like the Stone Cold book. Um, you would want the Undertaker book to have the sort of the, the feel and the open-ended nature of like um, Jericho's first book or the Bret Hart book, but it would probably not be that. Um, which would be a shame because I would love to hear about all this early stuff. But, you know, obviously the point of this is we're getting to the Undertaker character. Horrifying, isn't it? <laughs> Horrifying. That like guy's an enormous uh, hobbit. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> enormous hobbit. That's, uh, yeah, we can take it. You know, he's a ginger. And somebody pointed this out 
where part of the backlash that's happening with The Undertaker right now, because he's taken this shot at what appears to be a shot at modern wrestling and modern wrestlers. And so now people are digging up stuff. And this is something a friend of mine pointed out, that they're digging up all this stuff and how like Undertaker was basically a mark for women and how they, you know, how he fell in love with every stripper and that kind of thing. And my friend just pointed it out. Well, look at him. He's this big, goofy ginger guy. And that was probably a soft spot. And there's a part of him inside that probably always felt insecure. And I think if you look at the modern man um, and and his approach to things and what he thinks about things, I think he's, I think my friend is right. I think there's always that insecure guy. Um, but that's not to say that anything that he said was incorrect. It is a different time. Um, I told my friend that wrestling has changed significantly in the last 40 years. And I would say 70% of the changes, the sort of removal of the hazing, um, the sort of worst instincts of creating this elitist culture versus the have-nots and how one side has to treat the other badly and the sort of physical aspects of hurting people um, just to do it in many cases. I think 70% of that has changed, and I think it's good. I think that it's good that the guys don't destroy themselves. I think it's good that the guys tend, for the most part, to favor quality of life and have wrestling in perspective of their life instead of wrestling being everything and everything else being underneath it, be it family, their personal health, their mental health. Um, I think all of that is good stuff. Now, the 30% that has changed, I would say, for the worse is big because it mostly has to do with how wrestling is approached and what the emphasis is from management on down. So that's a great sum up of my take on Undertaker's thing of are we soft in the modern era? I mean, the answer is yes, but it's pervasive. I don't think it's about it's the fault of the new generation. I think in some ways, in many ways, the new generation um, are leading by example in this really great way, um, having not been led by example from the previous generation. They're really taking it upon themselves in many ways. And yes, there are negative aspects to that um, that I'll go into, but there's also a number of positive aspects. Um, they really have shed a lot of the bullshit um, from previous generations. Um, I think to wrestling's betterment and certainly to their individual betterments, but perhaps in many ways at the cost of the quality of pr the pro wrestling experience overall. Dead down anytime. Uh, I love how into this show is. Um, it's really charming. So, so, so I go there and. Uh, and look at his body language when Joe laughs and he's able to be self-effacing because keep in mind that guys were generally not self-effacing in the Undertaker's generation in wrestling. You never talked badly about yourself and you wouldn't broker no discontent and um, mocking from others. And I think this is a sure indication that the Undertaker is retired. I think he is done. I don't think he's going to get into a ring again, no matter how much Saudi money comes his way. I think he's done because you can just see in his body language and the, and the kind of like lift and the lightness and the lilt in his overall demeanor that he didn't even have in most of the parts of those documentaries. Um, and it's really lovely to see. It really is. I know that sounds like a crazy word to say, but it is. It's lovely. <laughs> I was about, I was there about eight or nine months and, uh, my contract was coming up and I go, I go in to renegotiate my contract and they were like, look, you're a great athlete kid, but no one's ever going to pay money to watch you wrestle. Um, you can tell those are words that definitely seared into him. Look at his facial expression, um, how he's just looking right at Joe. His hands are at his side. He's open. He's just telling them the truth of the thing that he remembers the most, which is, you know, I was there eight or nine months, and I, I wanted to get a paid bomb. And they told me, you're a great athlete, kid, but no one's ever going to pay to see you wrestle, which to wrestlers of that time especially was the worst thing that you could hear, that you were just a hand 
not even a good hand, right? They didn't say he was a great wrestler. They just said, you're a great athlete, which was a backhanded compliment back then. Um, that you couldn't draw money, which is the measure of a man in Undertaker's day. And I think part of Undertaker's resentment of the modern game is that guys are not expected to be draws. They don't make huge stars anymore because they don't want to be victim to them. And I'm talking about the WWE. And so the product has changed. Right? Um, and you could tell that there's a, always a resentment too, and, it, and it, this goes into hazing and everything else about pro wrestling. If you've gone through some kind of standard and some kind of hell because of it, if the standard for you was, we're not going to pay you more because you're not, you, nobody's going to pay to see you wrestle, that's the measure of a man. And that's the thing that he overcame the most in the WWF, remember, right? He became unbelievably huge. He was the WrestleMania draw. Right. I remember when uh, Stone Cold won the title and they set up that whole highway to hell thing at SummerSlam for months. It was undeniably a huge draw. And and now the guys are not held to the same standard and there has to be some resentment there. I know this is getting a little deep and unexpectedly so for many people listening to this. But imagine that the standards that you were held to. And I mean, he's fighting through a bad hip. He goes into that and all this stuff. And nowadays, the guys are treated better, as they should be, right? But still, there has to be a resentment there. I mean, when I think about, and I'm not comparing myself to The Undertaker, but I did come in at a time where you had to fight to get in. And, you know, nobody wanted to help, it seemed, at times. And... I mean, anytime I made a move, when I made the move from Colorado to Atlanta, you know, the people that I was leaving in Colorado threatened me directly and indirectly in a million different ways about how I was wrong to do this. And, um, you know, then I got to Atlanta and people tried to poach my students. And um, and then there was this idea that like, oh, you're getting trained by Stephen Platinum to the point where I even told my own trainees, like, I'll bring in guys to do seminars so you can claim that other people trained you because my name isn't worth anything. I was still stuck in that mentality. I wasn't about building my own brand. Now, granted, I built PCW up in the school and all that stuff, but my mentality was still that there was a part of me that was like, I wasn't worth it, similar to The Undertaker and how he felt at this point. Boy, I have never thought about that before. Whew, that was quite the revelation. All right, let's keep listening. Like. I'm just looking for a little bit of bump, right? A little bump in my paycheck. I'm not yeah. looking for the mega deal. I'm just looking for a little bit of bump. Wow. Now we're going to give you the same deal for a year. Wow. I mean, it, it, you just, you know, you do great things in the ring, but no one's ever going to pay money to see you wrestle. Did they give you advice on how to get someone to pay? No. You? Wow. No. That, yeah, that was and that's the resentment too, right? No, they didn't tell me how to to get over and get bigger and, and how to improve, which seems unbelievable, but wrestling was a different thing. You were expected to just do it on your own. And unless you were the darling of the promoter or the booker who would take you under their wing and try to make something out of you, or you were lucky enough to have somebody who looked out for you, or uh, there was a lot of luck and happenstance back in the day. There just was. And nowadays, the problem is the opposite, where it's too factory regimented. And so they're unable to, man you can't manufacture magic. But back then, they wouldn't give you clue one or a signpost to tell you how to get to magic land, right? It's just two totally different things. And the ideal is probably somewhere in the middle, and we've never had that. We've only had this, like the Undertaker's world, where it's just like, well, just get over. Or this, which is, we're going to hone you, and we're going to hone your in-ring talent, and we're going to come up with the kind of the safest way to work while still having it be interesting for television and blah, 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 blah. But, but we're also going to write your promos out for you. All these, all these avenues that they're severing away that really prevent a high percentage chance of magic occurring and being capitalized upon, right? Could you imagine somebody saying something nowadays um, 
and then the crowd having a bunch of signs about it and then they just jump on that bandwagon like Austin 316 it would never happen plus we don't even have a crowd there to jump on it the crowd are too busy trying to be clever themselves to recognize something great right like you look at the Bernie Sanders memes that are happening and you're seeing all the creativity um, surrounding that and all of those things happening um, there was a time where wrestling was like that where something would just catch fire for any number of reasons and they would just run with it now they think that it's all science that you can create the fire or you just start three or four possible fires and then maybe one of them will catch it just doesn't work that way right the word i'm looking for is organic and before they would not they would have a hostile environment against something organically developing nowadays it's such a sterile regimented factory oriented environment that organic never even happens or it's scrubbed out immediately as a negative Oof, good analogy that was it that was it so I'm like okay i've my ceiling i know where my ceiling is here right he knows where he's at so uh just through uh, you know a few different people i get connected with some people in the in the w that was wwf at the time it's wwe yeah. now so this is 89 90 90 i had a match coming up and my hip was already bad at that point even back really? then yeah uh, yeah I, it, it got much worse but i was already limping and uh and i just heard it when we'd got vince you know they had said all right you know they've got a pay-per-view just watch him work you know so Vince watches me work, and I'm calm, like I, I'm, I'm, you know, talking to my buddy Bruce. I'm like, Bruce, my hip is jacked. He goes, just go out there. Vince is going to be watching, right? So yeah. I'm working with a guy by the name of Lex Luger. Went out there and did what I could. I sucked. I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was physically, you know, I was physically not able really to to go the way I could go. And Vince wasn't impressed. You know, he's like, okay, he's, you know, he's run of the mill. So he's wrestling Lex Luger um, at this pay-per-view in WCW because he's not gone from there yet. And Vince McMahon watches and he's not impressed because he wasn't able to do the one thing that he could have done, which is to be athletic. He wasn't able to even do that. Um, and again, you could tell this weight. Look at his body language. He slumped. This wounds him. This hurts him. His eyes, his face. This is a definitive sense memory um, that's one thing about the modern game is nothing feels as all or nothing anymore it's never like oh so and so's in the audience watching and i have to, it's all or nothing it's not like that anymore it really isn't um and like i said you know with the priscilla kelly stuff there's nothing that would really preclude you from getting a job and but it does go to show how important connections are right because if not for those people who continue to bat for Mark, um, he would not have gotten a shot or a gig. And I need to point that out because that's very important because that's something that really hasn't changed. And in fact, most of the people who get signed now don't do it because of a good word of mouth. They really have to like get in there on their own and that's to be admired. And I'm not saying Undertaker's bad or wrong about any of it. I'm saying that's one of those things about wrestling that has become more difficult in one sense. Now, we're also in a scenario where you have AEW, you have Impact, and you have Ring of Honor to a lesser extent, but there are a ton of people working right now and a ton of options and places for people to go to quote unquote get signed or at least have, make a more viable um, living at this and to get seen more often thanks to the internet and things like that. So there are a number of benefits, but you know, if not for his friends vouching for him, he would have been dead in the water. That's important to remember as well, which is why I wanted to look at this instead of the obvious part that everybody wanted me to talk about. Well, fortunately, guys like, uh, you know, Paul Heyman and, and, uh, and Bruce. See, he's, see how he's looking down? He's accessing the memories. Who helped me? Who do I need to thank? And it's Paul Heyman and it's Bruce Pritchard. Pritchard. You know, they believed in me. And they kind of kept pushing to, for me to get this meeting with Vince. And finally yeah. I did. I, and he calls me. I got to go to his house, right? So so you see how he even licked his lips? I got to go to his house. So you could tell he's 
reenacting his feeling of I'm getting called to his house. What would your expectations be if you get to go to Vince McMahon's house back then? Surely I'm signed. And we're just going to talk about what I'm going to do. Awesome. Right? I go to his house. What is Vince's house like? Fuck. You kidding me? <laughs> What it's was Vince's nice. house like? It's and Undertaker's like, it's nice. He's in Connecticut, man. He's, so it, you're yeah, in Connecticut. Uh, yeah, so you I'm up in... Call to the castle. Oh, dude. See, he just wants to get on with his story. Like, Joe, I'm talking about the good stuff. And this is times where... He, Joe Rogan's asking a question that a lay person would want to know. What was Vince McMahon's house like? And his, his thing is like, dude, I'm about to tell you way more interesting stuff. Um, that's interesting. Because it's the first time in this this thing where there's like a bit of a, a schism and a break between Joe and the undertaker. Yeah. And that's what I'm thinking. Right. Cause most people go to the, you know, the office to the, to the towers there in Stanford. Right. And I'm thinking, fuck, I'm going to the house. I got this shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I go in and I have the meeting the meeting goes for about an hour and a half. And, you know, and this is, you know, imagine if the guys nowadays got that kind of personal time with Vince McMahon. Now I'm sure they do with, with Triple H, but it was a different animal back then, right? Where you had to impress Vince McMahon and you had to, but what you really had to do is you had to spark his imagination. And maybe that's a lot of the problem in the WWE is they sign people, but they, and they give them like pseudonym names, but not gimmicks per se. And then it's, but do any of them really spark somebody's imagination? Does the writing team, are they more worried about keeping their job that they are not really doing their job? And they don't even know what that is anyway. Who is Vince McMahon excited about? And subsequently, who has power that can get excited as well? I think that's a lot of the problem with the product nowadays in the WWE. There's a lot of... Does he have uh, a butler? Butler... Does he have a uh, butler? Yeah. So Joe, Joe's more interested in the mundane stuff. But to be fair, if you had somebody outside of, let's say, UFC world, like somebody interviewing, and, you know, Joe Rogan told a story about going to Dana White's house, they would probably ask these same kind of pedantic mundane questions. So I'm not that mad about it, but I am kind of like, let Undertaker talk, bro. Yeah, I know he had a housekeeper. <laughs> As a housekeeper there, he gave him something. Threw him a, literally threw him a scrap. You saw that with the fire. Yeah, right. You had to be, everybody, everybody's Jack that works for Ritz. But uh, so I go, I go there and. Uh, He's know, trying to find his train of thought. Uh, granted, we, we do some hokey shit. Uh, it is what it is. And they really, at that point, had some really really fucking goofy characters yes this is 90 and, so uh, some goofy goofy you know, stuff so that we're having this we're sitting in his living room and he goes what interesting right because one of undertaker's critiques of the modern game is there's no edge i don't think that's quite what he means here's what i mean it's not that there's no edge because i mean when he got there in 90 it's downright goofy by his own admission and he's embarrassed about it. He's just like, it, it is what it is, right? That's his body language. And he was given kind of a goofy shtick. It just wasn't as bad as what he thought he was going to get. That's why he was happy with The Undertaker. When you think you're going to be Eggman and Chicken Boy and whatever, you'll hear this in a bit. Of course, Undertaker sounds better. Um, but it's not so much, I would argue, that it, there's no edge. It's that everything is the blandest version of what edge is. Um, there is an edge about them. Nobody can tell me Timothy Thatcher doesn't have an edge. Nobody can tell me that Roman Reigns and what he's currently doing, it doesn't have edge. They're attempting to do something with Randy Orton and the Fiend and all of that. And even on the women's side, right? But everything just feels very dialed down. It's not goofy, so for that we can be thankful. But it's not goofy, but it's not as sharp as it could be or should be. Um, it's just not compelling enough. And 
the implication from what Undertaker said that I think people are taking so harshly is the implication is the guys aren't manly enough or edgy enough themselves that if you turn them up to 11, it's still on a low volume. And I think the problem is there is a distinct lack of creativity and a lack of inspiration from the office that the guys subsequently fall into this trap of, I'm going to keep my job instead of doing my job. That that's what everybody in the WWE is doing. Everybody's doing their, everybody's trying to keep their job instead of doing their job. Now, I'm not saying that's absolutely everybody, but the prevailing culture is one of keep the money train moving instead of what could we do? I think this element is gone because listen to this thing about how the undertaker came about. Mark, you got, you got any hidden talents, you know, other than, you know, wrestling, do you do anything? You know, and I'm trying to be funny and not nervous and, uh, well, you know, I sing in the shower pretty good. And as soon as I said it, right, I'm like, oh, fuck, I shouldn't have said that. I'm going to be fucking, I'm gonna be fucking be singing, shower guy or, you know, some shower guy. Something silly, right? Shower guy. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to say, you know, and I'm thinking, it's, and it, I'm like, oh, shit. I should not have said that, right? And now, now like, this I'm is kidding, all happening right? in real time in right seconds. Like, I'm just kidding. But... I can't sing. Not, not you know. And he, you know, he's got the look, right? And he knows how to, you know, he can read people. And he's like, really? I mean, no, I can't, I can't. So I got this long meeting, and I, at the end of the meeting, he goes, well, we don't have anything for you right now. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, well, fuck, I guess. Uh, look at, guess look at how it hurts him to this day, how he does this with his face. It hurts him to this day because he'd given notice. Played my hand here because I'd already give WCW my notice that I was leaving I like my my chest actually tightened hearing this just because of my own current situation and um man I kind of I mean, this is what I'm thinking in my head right I was like right. he invited me to the house he's gonna hire me right <laughs> so I you guys I see you guys down the road so now I'm sitting there like fuck I got no job <laughs> and uh anyway so one day uh it's getting it's it, getting close to Thanksgiving and uh, they start doing this promotion where they've got this giant fucking egg. You, have you heard this story? Oh, yeah, the gobbledygook. The gobbledygooker. Gobbledygooker, right? very well, good. So we do a pay-per-view around, uh, around Thanksgiving. It's called Survivor Series. So this year, this particular year, is 19... I'll say this, too. Undertaker's a good storyteller, sort of instinctively. He, he gives you the information that you need, but he gets to the good part relatively fast. I really enjoyed that, and it was the biggest surprise in this interview, actually. What a good storyteller he is. 90. They're going to... Yeah, there it is. Uh, they've got this giant egg on the set, on the TV, every week. And I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking to myself, holy fuck. I'm going to be, I'm now, now I've gone from shower guy. Now I think I'm going to be Eggman, right? <laughs> fuck, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm trying to grow my hair out. And I th fuck. imagine this tension. And now that nowadays the guys don't have that kind of pressure in the sense that they're not really afraid of the gimmick that they're going to get because they're really not going to get one. But in that tension is the potential for magic. And I think that's one of the things that's been lost. And that's not the f problem of the guys or the women. But, I mean, there's a reason. I just wrote a piece about John Moxley and how I see he th that he's the modern. He's not the modern Stone Cold. He's the modern Roddy Piper. And one of the things I noted was, like, when he got to be Moxley again after being in the WWE, um, there was the sense that he was taking that old spirit, that old deathmatch spirit, and everything that he had learned at WWE, and now he knew how to be a star, but he knew how to be his own kind of star. When Undertaker says there's no edge, he means in the WWE, but I would argue that Moxley very much has the thing that he's talking about. And there's a reason for that. Fuck, he's going to make me shave my head, I'm going to shave my eyebrows, I'm going I'm to be fucking Eggman. Oh, and I'm, I'm a nervous wreck, right? So one day I'm sitting at home, phone rings. I get up and go answer it because we didn't have cell phones back then, right? So, hello? And he goes, is, uh, is this The Undertaker? I was like, Undertaker, Undertaker. 
Undertaker and Eggman. I cannot describe the joy, and this is going to sound very harsh and very self-aggrandizing, and, and it probably is, but one of the things I miss about booking PCW was coming up with a brand new gimmick or a, or a, a big departure for an, a wrestler, and then bringing them in and having them do this big departure or this brand new gimmick altogether, and the thing getting over like Rover. Um, it's the reason that I say there's nobody now in Georgia wrestling who books like me because I created gimmicks from whole cloth. I created entire gimmicks to protect the guys, whether that was the War Horses, Campus Strike Force, that kind of thing. I developed the structure where the wrestlers could learn, have their own personal gimmicks protected, and create this vibe of of trying things in earnest and trying edgy and risky things, whether it was stuff like the Concrete Gorillas, which was not my creation, by the way, um, Dwight Power, which very much was, um, or this idea of this whole group that I would create out of whole cloth that would come in and demolish and put PCW out of business for a long time so they would miss PCW so then we could bring it back in a rivalry. Um, these were things I got to create and I don't think there's enough creativity going on at the indie level, much less the WWE level. And I think everything that Undertaker's talking about, I mean, whether you have a gun or a knife in your bag, all that stuff is nonsense and bullshit anyway. These are athletic guys. These are tough guys, right? Uh, that's, in that, I disagree with him. I think they are athletic. I think they are tough. I just think their priorities are different. And I don't think that they have been fostered in a creative environment. Now, Undertaker would put that on them. It's up to you to get over. Like, that's what a lot of old guys would say. But listen to this. He's being given a gift. And I don't know if there's enough gift givers in the WWE right now, or if that is even encouraged. Yeah, yeah, this is Undertaker. Yeah, and it was Vince, and that was how he introduced the character to me. He called you up and asked you if you're the Undertaker. Yeah, look how I had it, no clue. To look how it blown was. away Joe Rogan is, because it's such a uh, the antithesis of how it's done nowadays, right? And wow, yeah, and, he's blown uh, away. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm the Undertaker because I knew it wasn't Eggman, and right. like, everything had to be better than Eggman. <laughs> he wasn't singing the shower guy. Yeah, he wasn't singing the shower guy. It wasn't Eggman. Flew me up to Connecticut the next day, showed me the storyboards, and the character, the original character, is based on an old Western undertaker. Mm. You know, the two guys in Main Street, they had the fucking shootout. One guy loses, undertaker comes out, measures them, does the box. Well, that was the original likeness. And, and Original name, likeness, good way to put the it. Undertaker. And uh, he had just never found the guy. He had had it for years, I guess. So why did he? He had it? had it for years. Um, one of the most interesting things about PCW is all of the early gimmick concepts. Um, friends had drawn them for me once I explained at this meeting that I had with you know because nothing was happening in PCW. I mean, I didn't have a ring. I wasn't training anybody. This was in middle 2000s, right? 2004 to whatever, 2003 to 2009. Uh, it, it, but I described grotesque. I described the war horses, this idea of all the wrestlers wrestling in masks also, because I thought I would have a, a thin crew, so all the guys would have to double up. And so why not just create this group of guys that each have a number does that sound familiar? That's the dark order now, right? Everybody's got a number. Everybody's got their own distinct personality. I did that um, more than 10 years ago, but they all started as concepts. And so Vince McMahon had this concept of the undertaker and then he finally found the right guy to play it. And the rest is history. That's creation. That's manifestation of creativity. No way the first time. When you went well, to he, house, didn't ha he, he, he didn't have at the have time he didn't have a spot for me. But he was thinking. But he was thinking, and then it kind of dawned on him that he had that character, 
and he just needed a big guy with no personality. <laughs> <laughs> he just needed to have eyes. You know, re- I haven't to... rewound up to now, but that guy I stepped no on that joke. <laughs> <laughs> I had a guy with no personality. <laughs> he, Sorry, let me get back. Have a to spot it. for me. But he was thinking. But he was thinking, and then it kind of dawned on him that he had that character, and he just needed a big guy with no personality. <laughs> <laughs> he needed a guy, you know, that was void of personality, no personality. To, to do the deal, and, wow. uh, and and he gave it to me, and uh, there's my debut right there. Wow. Here's the debut. Wow. It's November of 1990. There's Bruce Pritchard, and I was six who's, years who went old to bat for him. Shitting my pants. Mm. <laughs> Were you? I love the this. Scariest thing you can imagine for a six-year-old. You know, you're watching all these, you know, the, it was some guy in a chicken suit that came out of that egg to show you how silly things were back then. So it had our attention. And then all of a sudden this guy comes out and he's like half dead and you don't know what's going on and he's scary and the, dominant the more thing, than anything. Yeah, the, dominant. the thing was, was dominant. But this is the area. That's, that's booking. They made him dominant. When he wrestled in the ring, he destroyed everybody. He no-sold. All these things that went against convention. But when you have the right gimmick, you can get away. You can do anything as long as you do it well. I've said that for years. You can do anything as long as you do it well. And clearly this was a thing that worked. Era of everything. I mean, you could tell. This guy's in bright pink. and Yeah. So that's Coco Beware. Yeah, he's wearing some hot yoga pants. Yeah, that's, you know. I mean, you know, that guy had a parrot on his shoulder when he came to the ring. Did he? Yeah. Right? Was it a parrot? Yeah, yeah, Frank. Look at that. Catch new episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience for free only on Spotify. Watch back. So that's my take in a nutshell. Undertaker's not wrong. But I think he doesn't get the depth of why things have happened. And why things have happened is because, and this is going to be an unexpected answer, Many of the changes that have taken place culturally amongst wrestlers are positive. They don't destroy themselves. They have a quality of life that's possible. They don't have to throw family under the the bus. They don't have to throw everything underneath the train of pro wrestling in order to succeed. But they also don't have that undenying obsession that comes with this is my life and this is my livelihood and everything depends on this. And the guys don't have the same tunnel-minded focus. But beyond all of that, the major problem, especially in WWE and the indie level, is a distinct lack of creativity and this feeling that if I crash and burn, I can't just try again. And these things need to be fostered and cultivated. All the greatest gimmicks in wrestling, all the biggest stars in wrestling had to go through different facets and changes and nowadays we have to quit pretending that everything one has to work right away or two should never be modified in order to attain success this has been stephen platinum looking at the undertaker's interview from the joe rogan podcast